Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here today to talk about dreams, not those dreams which we see when we sleep, but those dreams that don't let us sleep. I come from a very simple family, from a very small town, Soro, in Balaswar district, eldest of six children, five sisters and a brother. Daddy was a grade two officer in Food Corporation of India. Mommy is a homemaker. We lived wherever Daddy got transferred. Those houses where we lived had only one room and a kitchen, but it was beaming with ambitions, with goals, and it had a electrifying energy due to the collective ambitions and dreams. Mommy had a dream of going to college, study nursing and serve people. Daddy, he wanted to study a master's in English, but he had so less money that he even couldn't go to, school, uh, go to uh, college. Mommy, instead of going to nursing school, she instead got five daughters and chose to nurse our dreams. And daddy, since he didn't have money to buy books, he was often studying in local bookstores. But he transformed his dream to make sure that when we study, none of us ever feel that we don't have books. Lewd education. They never took rest until all six of us got the best of the education. And now we are serving at the best of the capacity for people. place, this is the time in life that I got my first inspiration, to dream, because I feel it was an audacity on my parents' part to think of giving six children the best of education. And this inspiration came very handy, because they never, they taught me not to, um, not to give up. They never gave up, even with very meager salary. And sitting at Soro, such a remote place, this audacity taught me how to dream, to have big dreams in life, and to keep working for it relentlessly until we achieve it. The house where we were living had bare minimum necessities. But those floors where we slept, where we ate, where we slept, we were taught purpose of our life. Values were instilled in us, and life lessons were taught. Even when we were small, my parents taught us how to strive hard to be useful. Their motto was to serve mankind is service to God. Manabaseba hi madhabaseba, vasudhaivam kutumbakam. And this, this was not just the quotes that they asked us to write essays and speeches, but they literally lived these quotes in their life. Mom was always ready to serve people. Whoever wants to go to hospital, she would always be there. Dad would finish half of his salary in just giving away whoever asked for any education purpose or anything. And that instilled service of mankind in all of us. And as a naive student, Almost every children in India, I too wanted to be a poet. I couldn't be. For a few days, I was very sad, disappointed. But the audacious me thought one day that if I became a physician, I would only serve a limited number of people in my life. What if I become a scientist and discover a drug? Then beyond my life, even beyond my life, I would serve for people because it will globally available, and it will help people. And with that thought, I started studying chemistry. Did my master's, and then went for PhD in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. As a very overconfident and naive PhD student, I never knew that drug discovery is such a overhauling, long process, a journey of perseverance and audacity. 
I chose to synthesize drugs for cancer because I thought at that time that cancer is such a difficult disease. I can always make another drug which will be better than the existing one. I never knew that at that time I have secretly made a choice to my destiny and there would come a time when I have to leave that place with every ounce of my courage. Because just after a year, in 2000, one day my mom called. The doctor is saying, Dad has cancer. I feel dead. It was gut-wrenching. Every day when I was calling, um, from phone booth, I was thinking that maybe next day my dad won't be there. <sighs> Imagining the death of, impending death of a parent is devastating. But I'm sure all of you would agree that in the case of cancer, it's not the death that scares us. What scares us, what traumatizes us, is the awareness that the therapy is effective or the side effects are so notorious and the painful part of the whole therapy. From then on, every day I thought, would there be a day that cancer drugs would be as innocent as an aspirin or a paracetamol? Would there be a day when cancer patients don't have to be hospitalized again and again? And trust me, this was the dream that didn't let me sleep from last two decades. Since I was a chemist in, uh, and doing PhD, I thought I'm going to synthesize new drugs and I'm going to change the world. I'll make, synthesize better drugs which would replace cisplatin and replace everything. But it doesn't happen, whatever you think all the time. So I, but I synthesized a lot of molecules. Most of them showed interesting activity, interesting biology, and very active in the cell. But when we went to animal model, they, all of them were toxic. That disappointed me. I thought, what is the fun in just synthesizing new and new molecules? You know? Why don't I understand what is the mechanism of action? Or how I can make it targeted? How I can make existing drugs better? So in that process, I changed my discipline. Not just I changed from chemistry to biology to biophysics to biochemistry, I did almost everything across a few years across continents, in, from IIC to IFR, Leiden, Oxford, Japan, in Kyoto. And during this time, one day, I discovered a new mechanism. I discovered that a new or a negatively charged molecule was going through the negatively charged cell membrane. And that was the eureka moment for me. Because that was against the conventional wisdom that negative, uh, we all think that cell membrane is negative and it has to be a positively charged molecule that can go in. But whenever you say something which is against the conventional wisdom, it's hard. Everybody almost are against you. So it took some four years of long, long experiments, hours of humiliations, to complete many experiments to prove that mechanism. And why that mechanism is important? Because I'll take a few moments to just explain uh, why, uh, why it is. And why that mechanism is important? Because I'll take a few moments to just explain uh, why, uh, why it is important. As you all know, after you inject a drug into, uh, intravenously, the drugs travel through the body, and they need to do three things. They have to first find the right target cell. They have to then enter, cross the cell membrane, and then they have to go to the intracellular target site, which is nucleus or any other organelles. Mostly, what happens is, in case of genomic medicines or in case of existing chemotherapy drugs, they, of course, can't find the target on their own. And especially the genomic medicines, the antisense oligonucleotides, the plasmids, the gene therapy drugs, they are negatively charged molecules. They can't go on their own to the cell membrane. 
So what scientists have done is they have discovered drug delivery molecules. And those drug delivery molecules are positively charged because the conventional wisdom is cell membrane is negative, so the drug delivery <coughs> molecule has to be positive, only then it can go in. And what happens then? The problem is twofold. One is when they go through the endocytosis process and form these ball-like structures, only 2 to 3% of the drugs can come out of those endosomes. So the effective therapeutic concentration is less. So you have to add loads of to see the same effect. The second thing is, when you, are, you want to increase the efficacy, the efficiency of cell, cell entry process, you have to increase the positive charge so that they can come out of those endosomes. And when you do that, then it becomes more toxic. Because of these two reasons, our genomic medicines, it's very hard to find them safe and targeted delivery. And for the existing cancer drugs, we are using loads of doses. As opposed to this, what Genie does, our technology, it's a negatively charged molecule, so it doesn't damage the cell membrane, and it directly crosses the cell membrane and bypasses those endosomes. So as opposed to your 2 to 3%, now all of the drugs are available to go to the uh, target site. And this is the breakthrough, a fundamentally different approach to solve the age-old problem. And based on this work, I, I, uh, based on this mechanism, I proposed to my professor in Japan. He didn't agree. So I came back to India and got a uh, 50 lakh grants from government of India to prove this concept and then formed Cygenica in 2017. So because of this breakthrough approach, Genie's cell entry mechanism has no equal. And this got international attention not just national, but international attention. World-class scientists, investors, and Nobel laureates join our board. From one person in Bhubaneswar, we are now eight of us internationally trained, full-time members across India, Ireland, and London. But this journey has not been very easy. I'm not there yet, as Robert Frost says, I have miles to go before I sleep. Since this is such a long, arduous journey, you all know to develop a drug, it takes millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, and more than a decade to get a drug out. And I don't have experience. I'm not from a business background. And in this journey of zero to one, most often people say, you don't have experience, you can't do it. This will never work. Sometimes a scientist say, sometimes a pharma executive say, sometimes doctors say, just blatantly, that you can't do it. But you know what? From day one, I know that I can fail any day. But I'm not afraid of failure. I'm still standing here. I don't know what will happen tomorrow. But I know I will go till the end until it has been proven that it will not work. And when you do that, every time, every time all the opposition comes. That is why I say all the girls out there, all the boys out there, pursue your dreams. Gather all the information that you want. Arm yourself with all the knowledge. But by all means, follow your dreams. And pursue it with all your heart. Who says? Ek, uh, there is a uh, poem that kisne kaha unna, unne ke liye punks chahiye. Hamne to hausle se budan se kaha. And when we do this, every day overcoming these situations, the naysayers, answering them, I feel I have three tools that I have used all the time. The first tool is never be afraid. Never be afraid of failure. I mean, my simple process is, whenever you want to take any decision, whenever you want to seize any opportunity, gather all your information, ask your friends, peers, mentors, and then ask yourself, am I going to die in this process if I do this? If you're, the answer comes that no, by all means do it. Because I feel if you're not dead, you can virtually do everything again.
You can rebuild your life again. You can do everything again. So stand as a rock in front of all obstacles. But do it. The second tool that I have is pursue excellence. I love what Oprah Winfrey says. When you are excellent, you are unforgettable. I was raised to believe that excellence is the best deterrent for any kind of racism and sexism. So pursue excellence. Never compromise on mediocrity. That will take you far. And the third one that I have, the tool that I follow is ask yourself why you are doing. Find your purpose. Because life will throw challenges at you. Every day, new, unprecedented problems would come. It will mess up with your plans. It will snatch your loved ones or snatch things from you. But if you know why you are doing, then you can stand and the storms will pass by. That why is important. Never lose sight of that why. But failure, who likes failure? Nobody likes to fail. I hate to fail. But if you haven't failed enough, you haven't really tried enough. Important thing is to learn from those failures and move on. Just dust it off and just move on. And when you are doing all this, Remember to be kind to others, to be kind to yourself, because you will never regret kindness, as Khalid Husseini says in one of his books. One of my coach always says, Nusrat, we all are work in progress. So remember to be kind to others as well as to be kind to yourself. I would leave you with a small story that one day a very young girl was going through a hard time. She came to, my, to her mom and started craving that all these things are bad with her. Then her mom took her to the kitchen. And she gave her, or they took three pots, one with carrots, one with eggs, and one with coffee beans. They added, she added uh, water to all the three and let it boil for some time. After some time when they came, she asked what is the observation. And what they saw is, as you know, after hard or long boiling, Carrot becomes very soft. Egg becomes very hard that the protein gets decomposed. But coffee bean spreads this aroma, and your coffee is ready. So she told that at the face of adversities, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't lose your own property. You, know, you take the best out of it, and take adversities as an opportunity. So it is your choice whether you want to be a carrot, or egg, or coffee beans. Make your choice right. Thank you.